Yes, Karen, sorry. I'm from Kiev, Ukraine. I work as a technical writer with the company Cosa Club Limited. We are a British Ukrainian company with a, an office of an R&D in Kiev. So basically we develop our tools, secure cryptographic encryption tools uh, in Kiev. We create libraries that uh, can help you encrypt and manage permissions using encryption and cryptography. Uh, in also I said well, uh, I will document our tools and uh, we will have our developer portal and documentation and documentation. Even though the trend is currently receding, I said that I need to mention that crypto has nothing to do with like cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever. Uh, cryptography is serious math and serious science. And cryptography is also security. And what is GDPR basically versus API documentation? It enforces some kind of standard of security on the documentation. And what is API towards GDPR? This documentation is something that can make a GDPR more doable, more understandable for your readers. And more secure. And security is love. Like, the well, person working in security, I cannot just express my love to Things that are secure and work well and will not get compromised. But unfortunately, in the business, the things are a bit, little bit different. Something like this. So, after trying to get people into making things secure, we have to compromise sometimes. So, at least better security is still love. It's still something that people try to make things not as bad as they usually are. And to be honest, when GDPR came into power, we celebrated like cryptographers. Everyone was panicking and we were celebrating because, yeah, finally, we can put our tin for our hats on, we can share the tin for our hats to everyone who wants to get more secure. And tell them the JDPR is la 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 la. But is it? Uh, how actually did JDPR come to be? of the European Union, European Parliament, they all got tired of all the data leaks. Like, you know, Uber, Yahoo, um, Equifax, Facebook, they all leaked data. Not somebody's data, your data. Who got logged out of Facebook recently because of the data breaches? Who got, yeah, I said this one hand. So the government decided they wanted to make things more secure for people. And another thing, a small quote. Who knows what this is? So. Oh. No, not quite, but not so. It's the hit mobile phone of 1996. Like, the best phone you could buy, the most trendy. It was cooler than an iPhone back then. <laughs> the iPhone also got introduced in 2007. You know what the problem is? The previous data regulation was introduced in 1995, before that trend the smartphone, smartphone, before the iPhone. So we were basically living for 20 years or more, like until this May, with highly, highly outdated laws that concerned data privacy and the privacy of users. I think that's scary. And another thing, like, uh, I'm not sure, sorry. Who of you clicked the I agree button without reading the license agreement, without reading the terms, so raise your hands? Ah, ah, yeah. cool. A few years back, uh, two companies in Europe carried out um, research in Great Britain. One company created a mobile device that was just basically uh, sending out Wi Fi, sharing Wi Fi. I think it was a bus, bus stop. And another company wrote software which just appeared on screen on your mobile device and asked, I agree to uh, this and this and this. So if you agree, you get Wi Fi. Okay, people agreed. But you know what? One of the points in the agreement was that people agreeing to use free Wi Fi was given their firstborn child for the end of the eternity to use the company. Of course, it was just an experiment and no one was taking away children from people. But it proved how people are messy with their data on the go, how they are 
not reading the documentation, not reading the <coughs> uh, things uh, that provide them the right to use license agreements. Because you know what? Just give me that service, give me that Wi-Fi, give me that app, okay? And that brings us to the vicious circle of ignored documentation, of ignored regulations, of ignored uh, license agreements. We say, ah, nobody's going to read it anyway, so we get a huge, huge, large text of unreadable, just, you know, an unreadable brick of text. People just skim it across, and no one reads it. And you do not put much more detail into it, uh, you do not put much effort into the text because you know, no one's going to read it. Why? I have other things to do that bring us to people not reading our documentation. Congratulations. So what do we do? Probably this. Or maybe there are a way to make our documentation, the FBI documentation, such that people are going to read. And GDPR is actually the thing that enforces it on us to make it secure, understandable, human. You know what? Like human language, you speak it. Why didn't you all the years before? Why you were documenting your APIs? Well, you were putting just blocks of text that only your developers will understand because it contains a lot of internal lingo, internal just law cliches, and just not basically caring enough about the documentation. You can put a simple, simple warning instead of a block of text of your offices. You know, you don't have to. It doesn't have to confuse anyone. Your test is very simple. Use simple human language for Normal humans who are going to use your cool apps and products and create great things for them, you know? That's basically it for the text part of the documentation and API documentation. Because that's not quite all what's going on, especially on the API portals. The thing is that all the tutorials, all those sandboxes, they have several layers to them. The first layer would be for people to agree or disagree to use it. And that's the expert consent, the thing that's uh, highly demanded by GDPR. You cannot just, you know, put this I agree, I agree, I agree buttons. No, you have to put the checkboxes. With each checkbox explaining what exactly people agree to, gives them the right to withdraw their consent, gives them the right to review it, and to basically understand what's going on with their data. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, um, Wi-Fi connection, uh, basic free Wi-Fi in some airport. We, as a security company, have such hobby. We uh, try to connect to Wi-Fi at airports and see just what kind of calls and data leaks can result from it. So it's, it was one of our guilty pleasures, and things are starting to improve. This is a, an agreement which basically finally says what you can do what you cannot do and what will be done to your data, which is a nice improvement. But it wasn't my screenshot. I will let you provide my own. <coughs> and what else is going on? So we covered text, like use human language, because there's nothing more you can add. Just use language people are going to read, are going to want to read. Put checkboxes and explain what you're taking from people, what you're giving people, what kind of data interactions is taking place. So we have like content with your websites and as uh, maybe um, like what design, sandboxes, links. So here's your basic like API portal, right? But let's get under the surface. That's not all. Your technical writers, developers, technical people. So you can't just you know shut your eyes closed. Maybe it will all go away. It won't because it also has the database storing the login for your users, the database storing their passwords, the database storing all the info you get from them. We all love this kind of apps, like, ha ha ha, online you can input your credit card info to see if it was not compromised, yes, but of course it was. So we laugh and laugh and laugh a lot. And then we take away people's emails, people's names, people's nicknames, people's addresses, people's phones, and just regard it like, ah, that's not special, not a big deal, it's just an email. It's never just an email. This just thing is covered by GDPR, and email is part of personal data. 
personal data is data that has to be identified somehow and it cannot be leaked. It must be regulated and if you in any way collect user data in your portals, you have to be responsible with it. And what force? There's also personal sensitive data. It's data is an uncovering of which will result in serious problems for users. It's like health information, uh, sexual orientation, religious use. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, one of the main uh, healthcare regulations also dates back to 1995, which is nice to know, you know, HIPAA. So, well, just do not let your data escape. Okay, not a short survey. Who of you has ever, ever, somewhere used the same password and the same email for two different services? Like something disposable. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, but yeah. <sighs> Why do we have this pretty rainbow on screen? Because one of the passwords you're using for some service, especially if they are not encrypted in a hash in a proper way, you know, like some services they will send you back one, recover my password, and they just email your password in plain text. It just gives me creeps. Uh, if it's done properly, that even if the service or you are sending out hashed passwords, like a uh, link to re reuse, like not reuse, a link to redo a password, you <coughs> hash to get started somewhere. If you're using your password twice somewhere, you can use rainbow table attack. It's one uh, pre-configured table of hash uh, created according to some specific, you know, like use one lowercase, one uppercase, one special character. So just basically a brute force which goes through a long, 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 long table of possible hashes and tries to match it to your or user's um, credentials. And once they get into one account, they may try to try all of your other accounts or, or use your other accounts and you're really screwed if it fits to your bank info or your house info or whatever. And dictionary attack like this pretty book, it's even simpler. It's just services, malware services that just try all the popular dictionary words and password against your account. So if you use one email somewhere and where you use very, very easy password like one, two, three for clarity, then um, attacker can just use your data, the user's data, and try to log into their other services. Using the info you leave somewhere on your API portal. Like you're not a company, you're just a small maintainer of a small piece of API documentation, and you can still just basically compromise the whole life of your user. Yes, the user is being reckless with using the same password, but you have to think about it and have to care about the user. So, it's never just an email. It's never just a password. It's never just a cookie you collect through API portal. Use it responsibly, please. Now I'm going to cover like the great answer to the JDPR universal life privacy. Just treat any data as very, very important data because of the reasons I already mentioned. And keep it simple. Don't get into you know long, long, long explanation that if your data is being transferred to company A from company X, and just again use human knowledge, please. For instance, uh, this is a crypto protocol, a socialist millionaire protocol, which basically lets two uh, persons compare some numbers. They have all the popular example is. Like two millionaires want to find out uh, who's richer, but they do not to, do not want to share the exact sum they possess. So this protocol allows you to just compare without disclosing numbers. It's a really really complicated cryptographic formula. Uh, I got it down to a couple of simple drawings and posted the, the Halloween article medium. Like basically, it's just to kids who want to compare how many candies they get at Halloween. So even the most complicated cryptography can be explained in a few comics. And anything can be, if you just care enough and get down to actually understanding it and putting out the core out for your users. So please do it. And by the way, that was a hit article that hit like more than 1,000 likes, while the whole you know, cryptography niche is like 10,000 people. At your FA portals, you, some of you use sandbox, so please be careful with them because in sandbox you get exact information with the user's data and the users might interact with your data. And 
malware malicious attackers, they can interact with your important data through hacking your sandboxes. So, for instance, how is Kubehub Aqua? It's a uh, um, data protection uh, suit uh, that uses, uses encryption, and we have the sandbox online, um, which lets people who do not want to code just install it and try how it works, how it encrypts things, decrypts things. And we have um, invite only policy for the sandbox because we don't want to have a million of possibly, well, for instance, statistically speaking, there can be half a million of um, Chinese young hackers, script kiddies, who are trying to cut their teeth on our portal. And we will get really, really weird emails piling up asking for permission, so we have to monitor it by hand. And if, if we are careless, we can let somebody have an access that they can't have. But we're a security company, we can see it right away. And most people, as I already showed you the comments with it, uh, small animal and security and what people think about security and implementing properly, you can be hacked through your inbox. So see who's subscribing, how they subscribe, and what they do in your inbox. And since GDPR asks you to implement security everywhere from the very beginning, sandbox text, documentation, uh, design, if you implement security properly somewhere, why not show it? Why not highlight it? We always try to include more warnings than we need to like. At the bottom it has like, please back up your keys, like really, really good for you. I think it mentioned like, please back up your data, back up your keys three times in the text. Because we understand that people are humans, they can be very smart, but they can be tired. So we have to get, take care of them. And we are right that we are caring about them. And where we are implementing GDPR things, where our products can help implement GDPR things, we just indicate it because maybe someone will come to your product asking how it can help them with GDPR. So you should put it up on your portals and actually just mention, highlight it. So this is how we can help you and we protect your data too, so we can be useful for each other. Uh, my screenshot of an um, airport Wi-Fi, I promise. It just yesterday had a really long, long layover flight. And now I'm just, oh, because I connected and finally it didn't give me some you know, obscure license. <laughs> it was a real human offering me real care over my data. Of course, I used all the possible VPN services when I was connecting, but it was a nice change. Because GDPR is, and all these regulations are something that help us be safe, us and our users, and the whole world, you know. And the funny thing is when the many companies were freaking out about GDPR in the spring of this year, no one knew how to implement it, what to do with it. Uh, there is one really like dark, heavy, uh, goss rock band, the Fields of Nephilim, or Fields of Nephilim. So their website, screenshot of the Fields of Nephilim website was the first ever resource on which I found this GDPR agreement button. So it was a revelation when I realized that sometimes your favorite rock band cares about you more than your banking service. So let's sum it up. Here should have been probably, you know, this um, traditional summary like bullet points, do this, 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 and this, and you'll be secure, you'll be GDPR compliant everywhere in the in your product, in your home, everywhere. But no, there is no silver bullet for JTPR. You have to think for yourself. You have to realize when you're taking the user's data, what you're doing with it, why are you taking it? And if you cannot take responsibility for user's data, passwords, and emails, don't take this data. And this also makes you very much compliant with JDPR, according to their points that calls up for data minimization, so you do not take what you don't need. And thinking about why you need to implement that security, you understand how. So this is your no bullet bullet point for GDPR. <coughs> and welcome on board, we're all now security team now, you know, not just security services. Well, thank you. Articles I would like to share with you. At the end, it's um, an article 
uh, for engineers, you can share with your engineers how to um, implement better GDPR compliance. Um, here is an article which takes not only GDPR but other uh, regulations and maps it out for you what you need to improve, what you need to take better care of. So I recommend checking it out. Also, just this is a full text of GDPR, you can find it anywhere I really recommend it. And you can find me here, find Cosy Clubs at cosyclubs.com and find Felix the cryptographic chameleon you saw on the slide with me as stickers, so come by, I'll give you a sticker of Felix the cryptographic chameleon. Thank you again.